Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering my listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash gothic rose and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title for free and start listening. It's that easy. Just go to audibletrial.com slash gothic rose to get started today. Join, Join the, the coven. coven. The Halloween Blackout A story written by Copperhead314 As the fall season approaches, I am reminded, as I am every year, of the Halloween that shaped my life in several ways. It was the first time I ever truly felt my life was in danger, and although it was terrifying, my love for Halloween has only strengthened with age. Senior year of high school, my three closest friends, whom for the sake of anonymity, I will call James, Tim, and Michelle, decided that we would go trick-or-treating. Yes, a group of 17-year-olds decided to go trick-or-treating. I never said we were normal. The plan was for us to meet at Michelle's house, as her parents invited us and her neighborhood and area had the most houses. Go trick-or-treating, then sleep over at Michelle's house as there was no school the next day. I dressed as a Task Force 141 member from Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. I was pretty into airsoft at the time and planned to join the army the following year. I dressed in full tactical kit and airsoft M4 that was irreparably damaged, which I know now was not a smart idea, but luckily did not cause any problems. James and Tim, however, dressed as stereotypical, basic white girls, complete with wigs, poorly done makeup, puff vests, Ugg boots, and purses. Michelle dressed as a nurse, much to her mother's delight as her mother was a career nurse. Michelle's parents took pictures, James and Tim wrapping their legs up around me as I struggled to smile without outright laughing at their antics and afterwards, we headed out. Having brought my assault pack to carry all the candy, we were determined to fill it to the brim before we headed back home. And I say with a sense of both pride and a slight embarrassment that we actually did. We ran into some of the freshmen and sophomores we went to school with, some of whom were bringing their younger siblings trick-or-treating. We walked with them to keep them company while they chaperoned their younger siblings, at one point carrying some of the little ones on our backs as they were getting tired. After dropping off our friends and their siblings at their house, we decided to walk through the outer stretch of the neighborhood, as it was not far from Michelle's house. As we came to the end of the street, we noticed the house at the very end had a bowl of candy at the end of the porch but with no lights on in the house. The house itself had the most distance from the other houses in the neighborhood, being somewhat isolated, but within 50 meters of the other houses on the street. Michelle said that she had a bad feeling about the house and said we should just turn around and that the bowl had most likely been picked clean. Myself and Tim said we wanted to at least check much to Michelle's dismay. James offered to stay under the streetlight with Michelle while Tim and I approached the house. About 30 or so feet from the house, a complete power outage plunged the night into total darkness. Michelle screamed and in the distance I could hear the screams of children and others in the neighborhood. I turned back to Michelle to tell her everything was okay as I pulled my gas-powered pistol from its holder on my leg, as I had a light mounted to it. 
Disconnecting the light from the pistol, I pointed the light to James and Michelle, seeing a very scared Michelle in the arms of a clearly creeped out James. Tim pulled a flashlight from his purse and shined it up down the street, seeing that there was no one else on it. As I was about to ask if everyone was okay, I heard the door to the house creak open. As the door opened, a man in a full ghost face get up from the Scream movie series stood at the entrance. He had opened the door slowly, almost ceremoniously, and just looked at us. I asked the man if he was okay, to which he slowly stepped towards us and onto the porch. Uh, Sir, we're kind of creeped out. Would you mind taking the mask off, please? I asked. The man tilted his head to the side like a dog and took another step toward us. Michelle gasped and whined. No, 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 no. Guys, let's go. My uneasiness was now accompanied by anger as the guy was now truly scaring Michelle. This isn't funny, dude. Drop the act, please. The man uttered a high-pitched giggle, sending a shiver down my spine and a sickly feeling in my stomach. Michelle yelled for us to come back and leave, and just as I was about to tell Tim to keep a light on him as we backed up, the man sprinted forward and leapt off the porch toward us. My gas-powered pistol was, unlike my M4, quite functional and was loaded. I had forgotten to unload the magazines at home and decided to take a gamble and simply play dumb if we were questioned by police. As the man leapt off the porch, I pushed him behind me and raised my pistol. RUN! I yelled as I emptied the magazine at the man, aiming at his masked face and backing up as I fired. The man reached up to his face, stumbling forward and collapsing to the ground, yelling out in pain. As he hit the ground, I turned and sprinted as fast as I possibly could. James and Michelle had taken off down the street and were waiting by the street corner, waving Tim and I frantically towards them and telling us to run. I waved them forward and told them to keep going, Tim reaching the street corner and waiting for me. The two of us caught up to James and Michelle. The four of us sprinting down the street, taking another turn onto Michelle Street and reaching her house. Out of everything, the thing that stands out the most vividly in my mind was running through the neighborhood in the dark, our flashlights dancing and waving through the darkness. Everyone's houses' lights were out, every street light, dark, and almost every house we passed eerily quiet. I actually had the thought in my mind of how I could probably never see something like this again. Though the thought was quickly replaced by the adrenaline pumping through my veins, as we reached the house, Michelle found the door locked, scrambling in her pockets for her keys. As I reached the porch, I turned and aimed my pistol and my light out onto the street, scanning for any signs of movement, praying we had not been followed by the man in the mask. Michelle opened the door and rushed inside, Tim grabbing my shoulder and leading me towards through the door as I kept my eyes on the street outside. I closed the door and locked it, hugging the wall and looking through the transom window of the door. The moonlight outside illuminated the living room and dining room through the windows facing the street. The kitchen and back of the house being dimly lit, I told everyone in a hushed voice to quiet down, shushing everyone. Michelle grabbed James, asking him if he was okay, then Tim, then me. Before she could grab me, I held her hand, pulling her behind me, shushing her and telling her I was okay. Tim crouched down and looked through the living room window, scanning up and down the street while James did the same in the dining room. Seeing nothing and hearing nothing, I asked Michelle where her parents were, to which she replied she didn't know. What do we do, bro? asked James. As if on cue, Michelle's phone began vibrating, her nails dug into my shoulders as she jumped and clung to me. As Michelle pulled her phone from her pocket, I saw that it was her mother calling, 
Michelle took a few deep breaths, calming herself before answering. In a calm and happy, though hushed tone, Michelle answered, asking her mother where she and her dad had gone. Her performance was damn near deserving of an Oscar. Her calm and happy voice in stark contrast to her shaking hand now clutched in mine. I holstered my pistol, waved James and Tim towards me, and whispered for them to find any flashlights or candles they could. They both rushed upstairs and within minutes returned, Tim holding two flashlights while James carried two packages of small candles and a lighter. Michelle hung up and started crying and hugged me tightly, the panic and fear she had been holding back all coming to the surface. Rubbing her back and trying to calm her, I told Tim to point the two flashlights at the kitchen and patio and for James to light and put the candles in each room. They both did so quietly, and I told Michelle everything was okay and that she was safe. Looking back out the window, still no movement. Though, in the distance, I could see the dim glow of red and blue lights in the direction of the street where the masked man's house was. I snapped my fingers to get James's and Tim's attention, whispering for them both to change out of costume. As they rushed upstairs to change, I asked Michelle why she hadn't told her mom and dad what had happened. Wiping the tears from her eyes, she told me that she didn't know. She just didn't want her parents to panic and be worried. She then told me that because I was planning on joining the army, she didn't want me to get in trouble for shooting at the guy. I, I don't know, I just didn't want to, she said, her voice trailing off as she started crying again. I shushed her and told her it was okay and everything was okay. Tim and James came back downstairs, now dressed normally. I told them both to watch the street and back patio. I then brought Michelle upstairs, dropping my bag of candy off in the guest room and grabbing my change of clothes. I brought her to her room, telling her to change, and that I would be right outside the door. She didn't let go of my hand until the door almost closed on my arm as she shut the door. I changed in the hallway, tucking my pistol in my waist and putting everything else away in the guest room. Michelle came back out, telling me her mother had just texted her, saying they were five minutes away. Michelle's parents had gone to a friend's house in the neighborhood for a little party. After the power had gone out, her dad tried to call us, but his phone had died, leaving her mother to get her phone from the car and then call us to see if we were okay. As Michelle and I got back downstairs, I told everyone that Michelle's parents were on the way. To this day, I still do not fully understand what I was thinking at the time, but I told everyone that we needed to play it cool and tell her parents that we had just been a few houses away when the power went out and simply walked back. I told them police might have been called over there and that for all intents and purposes, none of us were there. We knew nothing and that no one could prove we were there. I think at the time, Michelle's concern over me getting in trouble and putting my chances of joining the army in jeopardy, combined with young naivety, made me feel that being involved with what had happened had to be a secret. I didn't think at the time that, if the police hadn't been called for the masked man, that he could be free to not only possibly find us, but continue to be a threat for anyone else he came across that night. Luckily, a friend of mine at the time, whose father was a police officer for the town, confirmed that the police had been called when a neighbor saw the man run at a group of kids, and after tripping and falling over, had started yelling and screaming that he was going to kill someone. My friend's dad was one of the responding officers, and told him the guy had to be tased after he rushed at the officers. A large knife was found on him when they arrested him. When Michelle's parents got home, we all put on our happy faces and told them trick-or-treating had gone well. Michelle's father took James, Tim, and I out on the patio while Michelle and her mom started cooking dinner as the stove was gas and still worked. To our utter surprise, Michelle's dad offered us beer, telling us, although we were good kids, that he knew we had drank before 
at a party earlier that week and said, If y'all are going to drink, I'd rather it be here where I know you're safe. No telling your parents, though. He was a good man and treated us three like the sons he never had. We all had a beer with him while we talked about our future plans and imparting his wisdom. Michelle's mom called us in for dinner and I sat down next to Michelle. I saw the wine glass next to her plate. I looked at the glass and she looked at my beer, smiling. The following summer, I joined the Army National Guard as an MP. The events of that night had cemented in me my decision to join. When I had been faced with a bad situation, I stood my ground and kept my cool and used the events of that night as motivation that I had what it took. Two years later, when I was deployed to Afghanistan, I was a 240 gunner in a gun truck team. On a handful of missions, I wore a ghost face mask, which cemented my call sign, Scream, as well as the fact the members of my platoon would often comment that I bore an uncanny resemblance to the killer boyfriend from the movie. James and Tim are still my two closest friends, and after returning home from Afghanistan, I proposed to Michelle. We are still happily married. The four of us talk about that night around this time every year, and over time, the feelings of uneasiness have subsided.